Why China Matters. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. China's double-digit growth has helped multinational marketers weather a sharp downturn in consumer spending and economic growth in the West since the global financial crisis hit in 2008. But there are signs growth is slowing down in China. What does that mean for global companies who have been depending on China and other emerging markets? What's being said about China today in boardrooms in New York, London, and Paris? And ultimately, why does China really matter so much to multinationals? We'll find out the answers to these questions this week on Thoughtful China. We're joined in our studio today by Bob Jeffrey, Worldwide Chairman and CEO of JWT. Bob, thanks for coming in and welcome back to Shanghai. Great to be here. It's exciting to see you, Trevor. Let's start here. Just how important has China become globally for businesses and clients that you work with? I mean, there's no question that China is extremely important. I mean, we work with so many different clients in so many different categories, and there's not one client that doesn't have China at the top of their list in terms of growth priority. Now, you're obviously on a global level in talks not only with clients, but in some cases even levels of government. With recent signs that China's growth is slowing, do you hear concerns or questions from your clients about what's going on in China? Um, I think that for the most part, our clients are still very bullish about China. And I think that, yes, growth may be slowing, but I think it's the degree of growth. But for example, when I think about you know what are the big opportunities in China, you see increased urbanization, people moving into the cities. That's great news for clients of ours that are in the FMCG business because that means that they'll be buying more fast-moving consumer goods that, more, that are more or less recession-proof. But even clients that we work with that are more premium in nature, again, they look at China and they think huge opportunity. It's the youngest luxury market in the world. And in fact, I think it's the only luxury market in the world where more men than women are buying luxury goods. So, and I, and I think also the perspective for our clients is if you're, if you're running a global brand, and you're looking at no growth in Western Europe, you're looking at some challenges in the US, and then you look at the brick markets in China in particular, you're still thinking that it's the kind of growth that uh, you want to see on, on your business, especially in the future. But in your experience, was a lot of it a reactionary uh, response when they looked at 2008 happening in the States and saying, where else can we grow? Or were a lot of your clients already in, entrenched in China? I think, it's a com I, think it's, I think it's a combination. I think there were certain clients, Unilever is a great example. Unilever has been very committed to the fast growing markets for most of its history. So you know, Unilever had, had already made a commitment to, to, to markets like China, and China is obviously very important. There were some other clients who are more American based that I think you know, I think because of what happened in the economic recession and that crisis, they dialed up their efforts and dialed up their expectations about what they wanted out of China because they saw what was going on elsewhere. A lot of people talk about the upsider being bullish about China, but at the same time, I'm sure you've come in contact with global business leaders who have perhaps heard other stories about China or had experiences. Can you share with us, um, you know, some battle stories of brands that have come in and perhaps have backed yeah, out? Because we've started to see some exits. Well, I, I think, I mean, my own point of view is I think sometimes when that happens, I do think that uh, what what some what some brands do is they underestimate the degree of difficulty and the degree of complexity of the market in China. So, for example, I think when they think about pricing, when they think about positioning, uh, they they don't necessarily do the due diligence that's really needed. So, for example, you know when I think about brands and the need to really market differently here, even how they leverage what the benefits are of the of, of a particular brand, I think that. You know, I think w when brands do exit, it's, it's in, in a lot of cases, it's because they haven't really done the due diligence that they needed to do. Right, and the communication between their local offices and the global offices aren't always optimized. So, for example, we've had a lot of crises that locally here um, are top headlines and big news. But I wonder, do they travel back? So, for example, KFC and Apple have recently had a, a couple of big issues, KFC being a food safety uh, issue. Do those sorts of topics and crises travel back to the global headquarters and, and well, make a big difference? I, I mean, absolutely, they do travel back. And, and frankly, not only do they travel back to the global headquarters, but they get huge play in the media headlines. And I think the simple reason for that is, you know, China is front and center in the media world because if you look at all the economic forecasts, I mean, I think it's the projection is that in 10 years, China will overtake, you know, the U.S. economy and so on. So everybody in the U.S. from a business point of view is very focused. So as a result, when those issues do happen in China, they get you know prominent attention. 
Um, at the same time, a lot of companies, MNCs that are working in China feel as if more and more there's not quite a level playing field here. Is this a concern for some of the global clients that you work with? Um, I, don't, I don't think they think of it as not being a level playing field. I just think, I think the more sophisticated global clients realize, like any other market, there's a degree of complexity and there's a degree of understanding that's needed here that is unique to China and not elsewhere. And I think, I think if you have that perception or that context, then you, you, you're more inclined to think of it as a level playing field. You've been traveling now to China on and off over the past uh, number of years. What's one of the things that surprised you most when you first arrived here? I think what surprised me most is the is the size and scale of it. I mean, when you think about just the amount of people, I mean, like you know, the number of people that exist in the cities, and also the amount of, I mean, I'm a huge uh, collector of photography. So one of the things I've done over the years is collect photographs of Shanghai. And the reason why I've done that is that every time I come, you know, there are sections that Shanghai have literally disappeared because there's new buildings that go up, you know, more or less new neighborhoods. So that's what's fascinating to me. It's almost like the amount of change you see in a five-year period in other cities would have happened over 20, 30 years. And I'm, I'm intrigued by that just from a cultural point of view. Now, you spend most of your time traveling. Um, and China is just one stop on, on the many stops that you make around the world. How would you compare it to other high growth markets? Well, for example, one other market that, you know, I, I was just in India a few months ago, and again, you go to, I, what I find interesting about both these markets is that, first of all, people are supremely optimistic, and that's not the sentiment that you would necessarily find, necessarily find in a place like Western Europe. So there's a tremendous level of optimism about the economy which means that from where I sit in terms of marketing and communications for brands, it's great because people actually do believe in brands. Uh, in the West, there's, like, there's almost a certain level of cynicism about brands, but in, in, you know, in fast-growing markets, you know, people really do see brands as enablers for their economic ambition, for their social ambition. So I find that very refreshing. I find that very energizing. and Because, I mean, I think in our business, you have to be positive anyway, and, it, and this is kind of uh, you know, nutrition for being positive and optimistic. How does JW JWT, which has done very well in China, how does it prepare for growth and change, or in some cases, slow down in a market like China? Well, I think in terms of, I mean, if I look at where we are from a global perspective, I mean, one of the biggest missions I've had with JWT is to, rec there are two big forces going on in the world. One is the force of geography, and one is the force of technology. And if you look at the narrative over the last several years, it's about technology being a disruption in the business. and. So my view is we've had to embrace that. We've had to embrace more non-traditional. We've had to embrace digital, and in a way that I think is really unique, which is you know doing it in a more integrated way. And I think on a geographical basis, you know we you know we've been in Asia. You know we first came here. I think India was our first office, and we opened that up in 1929. So now, I mean, our focus is really increasingly on how do we give the support and investment in these markets because this is where the growth is. And, it, and support and investment is, is about, it's about a talent issue. It's about having, making, making sure we have the right talent here. It's about nurturing that talent. I mean, China has been a great talent story for us. I mean, I think the senior team in China has more or less been in place for the last 15 years, which is exceptional when you think about the amount of churn in this market and so on. That's right. The stability is actually something we've talked about on the show. It's unique. That leadership. It's, it's, it's unusual unique. to see that in any market around the world, especially in the advertising world, let alone China. Now, you touched upon non-traditional and the growth um, in the West, uh, in those sectors such as digital or shopper marketing, and, and et cetera. In China, do you plan to invest more in the new media and mobile and digital as well? I mean, absolutely. If you look at what we're doing in China, uh, we've made a huge, you know, huge investment around a philosophy that you know, digital really needs to be integrated inside of the main offices. So for example, one of the clients that we have in the Shanghai office is Starbucks. And everything that we're doing for Starbucks is in the digital arena. And the other thing that we've been doing in Asia is we've been very aggressive on the acquisition front, meaning going out and getting companies that we can either acquire or build affiliations with that can enhance our digital capabilities. And Shopper is a huge opportunity for us. If you think about Always, Always is, is probably the largest uh, field marketing operation that exists in China. It has coverage, you know, up to I think more or less 600 cities. So I think those are all areas that historically, you know, we've put a lot of emphasis on and will continue to do so. You mentioned earlier Unilever being an example of a brand that's invested, a company that's invested in China early and deeply. Can you talk about clients that have invested in China and it's paid off in a way that's affected their businesses and business practices globally? I think that, uh, I mean, I think Unilever is a great example because I think, for example, you know, with Unilever, personal care is a huge priority for them and that's more or less the area that we operate in. 
And I think what's interesting is that so much of being successful in China is understanding, you know, kind of from a multicultural point of view, what you know, what is unique about what you know, what what goes on here, and how to leverage that with brands. And I think that what's interesting is, you know, how do you even export some of that learning to other fast-growing markets? So I think that's been the advantage about, you know, for certain brands on. I mean, and I can think about other brands as well. J and J is a good example with Listerine. We have a number of brands where, by you know, really, you know, putting the effort into penetrating this market, it's had positive ramifications on on the brand, uh, you know, outside of this particular market in terms of learning about the scalability of the brand and how to leverage it in different channels. There's often a lot of talk about China, you know, taking learnings from the West and adapting them or changing them and applying them to success here with varying degrees of of success. You know, whether it's taking a, an actual business model like a YouTube and turning it into the Chinese version, or people often talk about the Chinese version of Twitter, et cetera. Do you think that there are learnings that Western companies can take from Chinese companies or the way that business is done in China? I think that, I think that one of the biggest aspects of doing business in China is the complexity of dealing with the scale of it. So for example, when I was talking about Always and looking at how Always operates from a field marketing point of view, when I think about the application of this you know, huge uh, level of resource that goes through all these cities throughout China, uh, the deployment of a promotional activity, the deployment of activation activity. So one of the things we're planning with always is how do we actually expand that outside of the, outside of the China market? How do we take that learning and even bring it to other markets as well? So that's an example of, I think, a very successful practice in China that has application to markets outside of this particular geography. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, Best piece of advice is when I came into JWT in 1998, uh, we won the Merrill Lynch account, which was very significant at the time. And we were developing a global campaign for Merrill Lynch, which was very exciting. And I remember having a meeting with the CEO at the time, uh, Dave Kamansky. And I remember saying, and I, he, the, the agreement was he approved the campaign, but he said, Bob, you're going to have to go to every market and more or less get everybody to approve this. And I said, well, Dave, you're the CEO. Can't you just tell everybody that, you know, get on board and we're going to go with it? He said, no, because what I've learned in, in, the, in the role of being CEO is the more you use your authority in that way, the less authority you will have over the course of time. You really have to influence, motivate, and inspire people to get on board. So that was actually one of the best pieces of advice I got, especially ultimately when I became the global CEO of JWT, that, you know, that being the CEO is not about being a dictator. It's about inspiring people and motivating them to do the right thing. So there's a difference. Great. Bob, thanks for being on Thoughtful China. Thanks, Trevor. It was great to be here. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.